I'd like to welcome you all to the, um, the first Meacher Legislator session of the 2011 uh, General Assembly. And um, we've got a few um, uh, things to uh, get started with. And uh, first, I want uh, to announce that we have our sponsors, and I'd like to thank those sponsors, and that's the League of Women Voters, the uh, Evansville Teachers Association, Valley Watch, uh, Plumbers and Steamfitters Union, uh, 136 local, Teamsters Local 215, uh, Sustainable Communities Coalition, the Isaac Walton League, Evansville Chapter, and the Evansville Vandenberg uh, Public Library, and I want to have a special thanks to the uh, public library because of this wonderful facility that we're able to use for these events. It's uh, just about perfect for what we're trying to do. And they're providing a huge service. Uh, this is being videotaped and will be shown on uh, WNIN. And I'm not exactly sure when, but check your local listings, as they say. And we also have um, uh, Darren, who is sitting down over there monitoring the sound, uh, except for mine, apparently. He's monitoring everybody else's sound, and he is in charge of setting this room up, and we very much appreciate uh, his assistance in uh, making this kind of thing possible. Um, and thank all of the sponsors for their efforts uh, to make this work. The, um, I'd like to thank you for showing up, and I'd also like to thank the uh, legislators, because as I always say at the beginning of these meetings, the Meacher legislator sessions would be a lot different if we didn't have any legislators here. So they're kind of key to what we're going to wind up doing. And so we'd like to thank the legislators especially for attending. I'd like you to note that we do have some refreshments. We have some uh, coffee, uh, regular and uh, decaf. We have some juice. I think we have some tea over there. And we have some, um, uh, some uh, pastries. And so please help yourself to those. Anytime you want that, just go get it. Uh, we do have the classic donation jars. If you'd like to make a donation to help cover the cost of that stuff, that would be absolutely wonderful if you're able to do that. Uh, when you're done with, um, with either your napkin or your coffee or whatever you're using, uh, we have a trash can over there. And just place your uh, mug on uh, the table so we can get all that squared away. And we really appreciate you doing that. If you'd like to be notified of all of these events, uh, what we'd like you to do is at the back table, wave your hand. We have a sign-in sheet back there. Uh, please uh, print your name and very legibly print an email address. Email address is not like a, a street address. It's, for you to get it, it's got to be exact. So please carefully print uh, that. And what we do is we promise not to sell that to anybody. Uh, but that goes to the Evansville Teachers Association, and every time we have one of these events, you will get an email notification of the event if we have your email. So uh, that's the only uh, way we use this. The uh, format that we have today is, um, oh, uh, first I might want to mention uh, the uh, library rules. The library does have a couple rules. Um, uh, fortunately, we... They do have a rule that does allow refreshments and coffee, so we do appreciate that. Several places don't have that rule. And um, so one of the rules is no alcohol, even though you may desperately want some alcohol. Uh, the, uh, the rule is no alcohol. And the other one is no weapons. So if you have any weapons, uh, we need you to uh, take that weapon back to your vehicle and lock it in there. And uh, we would appreciate that. So. And that's two of the rules. I think they had three rules, but I forgot the other one. What's the other rule? Um, solicitation. solicitation. Oh, okay. Well, uh, you are allowed to solicit your legislator to do what you want. So <laughs> we're going to modify that a little bit. But other than that, no solicitation. Uh, and no smoking, yes. no. Sm that's actually, I don't think that's, that may or may not be a library rule. But that's, all, that's going to be our rule, though, so no smoking. We appreciate your compliance with all of those. Is that no weapons rule in writing? That no weapons rule is a rule. It is not in writing, but it is, it is enforced. If you have a weapon, please exit now. I don't need one. Okay. Then uh, if anybody does have a weapon, you need to exit right now and get rid of it and lock it back in your vehicle, and then you can come back in. If you don't want to do that, then you just exit. And you keep your vehicle 
and keep your gun, but don't come back in. That's the rule. That would be enforced. Uh, policemen should be here fairly soon, so in case anybody's got any problem with that. We do allow one gun, and that's by the policeman, but nobody else. Okay, the format for these events will be that each legislator will get three minutes to update you on either what they have been doing in Annapolis or what they want to do in Annapolis and uh, their activities uh, with the legislature. Uh, once each legislator has had three minutes to do that, what I will do is then, then it's your turn. Then I will call on the audience members and we'll go side to side. And we'll call on one side, somebody from one side will have a couple minutes uh, to come to the microphone that's up here to my left. And they will be able to take two minutes and ask a question or um, uh, ask the legislator to support a particular type of legislation or some issue, whatever their issue is. They have two minutes to um, advocate for that issue. Once they do that, I will ask if anybody else in the audience has a slightly different take on the same topic. If they do, they'll have about a minute to present that different take on the same topic. Uh, once that is done, then we'll have each legislator will have an opportunity to respond to that issue. And uh, what we have is about 12 minutes for each issue. So I'll try to ask uh, each legislator to find out how many of they want to respond. Not every legislator has to respond to every issue. But we'll ask them if they'd like to respond. And I kind of like to try to divide up the time. So the goal here, and since we're not very crowded today, uh, we should be in good shape as far as time goes. Because we want to go back and forth until about 11 o'clock. And that's when we want to adjourn. So I, the goal here is to get as many different issues uh, out as possible, as many different issues out as possible between now and 11 o'clock. And so that's kind of the idea to try to make sure that we have that. When the room is more crowded, it, it uh, gets to be a little tougher because clearly that means there's more potential people that want to speak. So at any, way, at any rate, uh, that's basically the uh, deal. I will indicate to you when you got about a half a minute left on your talk. And I'll try to do that with something like this. Hold that up. Oh, actually, this side. Had it backwards. Hold that up, and um, and that mean that basically means you got 30 seconds left, and what you'll need to do is kind of finish up. Uh, and so you don't really want to finish up after your time is up. You want to finish up by your time, uh, by the time you're done. Okay. Uh, that said, um, uh, that's about uh, all we have. I will announce later on again. But the legislators can be contacted all the time. So if you want to contact your legislator, you can contact them by phone uh, using either the House or Senate, Democrat or Republican telephone numbers. And the House Democrat number is 1-800-382-9842. The House Republican number is 1-800-382-9841. The Senate number for both parties is one 800 382-9467. If you want to email your legislator, it's kind of simple. If they're a senator, you put an S down. If they're a member of the House, you put an H. And then you put their district number. And um, district numbers are mentioned on the tags up here. But we also have some maps showing their districts. So if you don't know who your legislator is, you can see where you live on the map, and you'll f you can find out who your representative is in either the Senate or the House. But then you put down that Senate or House number, whatever that district number is, and then you put the at symbol, and then in.gov, and that will get you to their email. If you'd like to explore government, which is a fascinating thing to do, uh, and find out about uh, what's happening at the Indiana General Assembly, in your browser, just type in www.indianajournalassembly. Just bookmark that page when it pops up, and you can find out all kinds of stuff. The calendars, the, uh, the bills have been introduced, the language of, the bill, of each individual bill. You can find out a tremendous amount of information using that. So that's the way to contact your legislators during the whole time. Okay, you've heard enough from me. Now it's time for us to go to our uh, a program. And we're going to start on the um, Senate side, uh, giving our two senators the first chance at saying, uh, essentially their report from Indianapolis, and we'll start with Senator Becker. Well, there's not much to report. 
it's rather early in the process. In fact, uh, organization day was Tuesday where uh, new representatives and new senators were sworn in. And um, we had a caucus and I'm working on a few bills for the next session. One of them is counseling options for people who leave a hospital so that senior citizens in particular know that they have other options rather than just a nursing home. I uh, had a bill last session. It got kind of uh, had other issues attached to it and it didn't move. I think there's a lot of support from even the hospital association on this issue. So I'm going to file that bill. I also was contacted by a constituent who uh, was very concerned. She was a cancer patient and um, she went for reconstructive surgery and um, the doctor used a, a one-time use medical device uh, and it had been reused, it had already been used once. And so she ended up with the thousands of dollars of hospital bills. Uh, and so I'm also filing a bill that, you know, it's an infraction if a medical person uses a device that's only a single use uh, medical device. Those are just a couple of things that I'm working on. I've got a few other things as well that I'm putting together. But I think the, the main issues for this session is a two-year balanced budget, which is going to be extremely difficult. Because as you know, um, we are, Indiana's revenues are down. Structurally, right now, we, for this year, starting July, the next year, July 1st, we are a billion dollars short in our revenue stream. And that's just for the year. Uh, it's another billion for the following year unless revenues start coming back. And they are start coming, but you know, they have started improving, but they're still very slow. And all you have to do is look around in the economy to see that that's the case. So that's going to be very difficult. But Indiana, we have, unlike the federal Congress, we have to have a balanced budget according to our Constitution. We can't just go out and manufacture money. So uh, that will be probably the most challenging issue is to uh, make sure that the budget is fair and, and equitable for everybody, including taxpayers. And so that's going to be a real charge. We have um, education takes up more than half of the state's budget. And um, it, it's also a critical portion of the budget. We also have Medicaid issues. We have transportation issues, highway issues. Um, and so parks, all of your state parks, all of those issues are affected, universities. So, so it's going to be difficult, but we're going to, I think we're up to the task, and we will probably not finalize the budget until the end of April because they will look every month to see how the revenues are coming. So with that, I would just, um, I did want to say real quick, I have an email sign-in sheet at the, at in front of Kathy, back there on the table. If anybody is not on my email list but would like to have emails from the Senate, I'll be happy to have you on my email list. Be happy to add that. Uh, it also gives you a way to communicate easier with me, too, as well. So I appreciate your input, and I also appreciate you being here very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next would be Senator Holmes. Well, I... Uh... I am a freshman senator, and I have even less to say about what's going on than what Senator Becker had. Um, it was really uh, enjoyable to be up there. Yes, it's not on. Okay. Does it make a difference? Yeah, that's better. Yeah, that's good. Anyway, um, it was really a, it was really a, a nice experience to be sworn into state senate, and um, I'm looking forward to um, the work that I've asked for you to employ me in doing. The um, I know that. Uh, my few days that I've been up there so far, uh, as Senator Becker mentioned, the budget is the big thing that you're going to work on. I know that, uh, you know, a billion dollar shortfall, that's, that's a lot of money. And I know it's, it's going to be a struggle, but, uh, and also I know that redistricting is another item that they're going to be dealing with uh, up at the legislature, this assembly. I guess um, I just want to mention to you that uh, I'm delighted that I was elected to this office and I'm looking forward to... Uh, uh, providing the service that I've asked you to allow me to do and within the constraints of the Constitution understand what this uh, job uh, encompasses. 
And I know that uh, a lot of folks have a lot of things on their mind. There's a lot of important issues. I know during the campaign when I was, people would ask, what's the number one thing you would like to deal with? Well, it's not that simple. There's not just one thing. I wish it was just one thing. But everybody's got something that is important to them. And, um, and it's really evident and very clear, uh, as it was Tuesday, coming out of the uh, chambers with all the people in the hallway out there that come up to me with all of their cards or business cards and, and um, what they propose and what they're asking. So yeah, there's no two ways about it. There's a lot of things out here, not just what the, the main issues that we're dealing with on the budget and the redistricting, but with individuals out here. And I understand that. And so um, I just want you to know that um, from the standpoint as, as being just a citizen all my life, uh, attending these meetings and now being up here on this side of it, that uh, I understand that concept of, of listening to what folks has got to say. That's why I chose to run for office. So I appreciate being here today. I'm looking forward to the questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll now move to the uh, House side uh, and start with uh, Representative Crouch. Thank you. Um, I I get this forward. thing on. Okay. Uh, the, the, the button on it you know, should go forward. I think it's on. Yeah, it's yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, Wendy McNamara sends her apologies. She can't be here. She didn't receive notification of the meeting and um, had something else scheduled. It was sent to her legislative email address. Like she didn't receive answer. notification, possibly because they haven't assigned all, legislative assistance to all those people. But anyway, uh -huh. um, <clears throat> as the senators have pointed out, this is a fiscal budget year, and it's going to be very difficult. If we flatlined spending at fiscal year 2011 levels, with the exception of funding Medicaid at a 5% growth, and fully funding growth in pension obligations, and revenues were to grow by 4% over fiscal 2011 forecast, our budget shortfall in fiscal year 2012 would be $1 billion, as has been pointed out. So while there are many, many people and many, many groups that have very, very, very valid concerns and issues, there needs to be a recognition that there's actually going to be less money to deal with. <coughs> what then that puts the burden on government to look at ways to cut expenses, not only to people that are paying taxes, but to people who are receiving services. So we need to look at how to cut expenses to those people that are providing services. And that is one of the reasons the Speaker of the House created a government regulation committee to look at ways to cut government regulations that increase costs to, p to individuals and to businesses and to profits and nonprofits. Uh, it, it, this past summer, I served on a number of committees. I served on the Developmental Disabilities Committee, and I got a bill approved that would, in fact, reduce costs to profits and nonprofits who provide government ser or provide services to disabled individuals. And it would look at the amount of audits and surveys that these groups are, are, are subject to and ways to coincide and to um, reduce those costs to those individuals so that they have more money. While they aren't going to get any more money from the state, they'll have more money than to provide services if they don't have as much in terms of government regulations. I also served on the Economic Development Committee this summer and worked um, with the University of Southern Indiana and with local economic development officials to work on ways uh, to provide incentives to young entrepreneurs that would not only encourage technology and innovation in our area, but also would work towards keeping those individuals here in our area, as opposed to them leaving and going somewhere else for jobs. I also served on the Medicaid Oversight Committee, and that committee really is um, very concerned at looking at the cost of the expansion of Medicaid as a result of the Health Care Reform Act or the Affordable Care Act. Um, and then Pension Management Oversight Committee. Interesting thing there is that that committee has charged the state with looking at ways to divest retirement funds in those countries that have companies that, um, in, in companies in those countries that are actively involved in terrorism. So by 2012, 100% of our pension funds will be divested from those countries. Uh, anyway, thank you for being here. Thank you for the opportunity to serve you. And I look for your input so that we can end up making the right decisions for you. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, next is Representative Bacon. I would first off want to thank all of you for being here, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Is that good enough? Yeah. Get here? Good. Okay. Uh, Senator <coughs> Toms and I, uh, of course, are freshmen, and, and our first thing to do after we got uh, swore in, sworn in and, and went to an orientation session was, number one, we got to find some place to stay. And because uh, you do have to drive up here and stay all week. So our concerns right now are a little bit different uh, than uh, the constituents right now because uh, we have to first find out what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, and the processes of what we're doing. So we've learned quite a bit, and we've, we've gotten a lot thrown at us the first couple of days. And we've got uh, a couple more days in December to, to learn funding mechanisms and uh, a few other things that go on before we actually start our first day on the 5th. So we're, we're really, really looking forward to it. Uh, I've talked to a, a lot of my uh, constituents uh, in my district. Uh, there's a number of things that we want to work on. Uh, my background is in business, uh, respiratory therapy, and, and the healthcare field. So I've got many of those things that, that uh, I want to look at. <clears throat> a couple of things I'll just bring up to you that we've already talked about, and uh, especially also within the healthcare, as my background with uh, coroner <coughs> and law enforcement also. We're, we're working on with the local law enforcement, and this is quite interesting. We're going to try and introduce a bill to uh, put pseudoephedrine, which is used to make meth, for all of you who don't know the term for that, uh, back on the prescription drug uh, bill. And so it is require a prescription drug to get this. This is pseudoephed, for those of you who don't. The problem with that, I've been finding out, I've been really checking it out with the Northern uh, Indiana Pharmaceutical and that and so forth. Pr apparently the problem that we have down here in Southern Indiana isn't up in Northern Indiana. And we're gonna have a little problem with that, getting the rest of them to go along with us. But we're still gonna do it because it, it's, it's a huge problem down here. And we have uh, methamphetamine manufacturers that are going on constantly in, in our rural areas. <coughs> and those of you who don't deal with it on a daily basis, as I have done with the coroner's office and with law enforcement, we have a big problem. And this is one of the things I'm really going to go after. We need um, to work with the legislators on, as uh, Suzanne said about uh, getting rid of the regulations on small businesses and that to, so that we have more uh, ready, ready cash and less regulations for them to operate. That will improve our uh, economic uh, basis for them. So we, we've got to do that. And I was really thrilled that the speaker set up a committee just especially for that. So I was very, very pleased with that. I want to work in the agriculture area because uh, 75 percent of my district is agriculture. Uh, so I'm really going to be working, looking hard at that also. And, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, some of the other uh, medical problems that we have um, in some other areas that we've been looking at. Another one that we had, as I talked to the uh, uh, Indiana Organ Procurement uh, Organization yesterday in a meeting we were at, and uh, just a simple little thing is uh, standardi standardizing uh, brain death criteria for the organ procurement organization so that we uh, have a standardized way of doing that so that at every hospital when they have uh, brain death, you would think that that is standardized, but it's not. There's a number of things that we need to get done and take care of. This is something that won't cost us money. It's just a matter of uh, that type of thing. So I will be dealing a lot in the healthcare field and that, and then looking forward to what the rest of you can bring to us as legislators to work for you. So uh, thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, now it's uh, your turn. What we're going to do now is uh, start uh, on one side of the room and ask folks to uh, come to the microphone, which is up to my left, and just state your name and uh, then begin your issue. And you'll have a couple of minutes to present that issue. So uh, show of hands over here. Anybody who wants to speak to an issue? OK, this is going to be a short session. Start right over here on my left then. Right up here in the front, you're first. Please step up to the microphone and uh, state your name and uh, your issue, please. My name is uh, J.D. Strip. My name is J.D. Strouth and my uh, topic today is on redistricting. Uh, I define um, uh, gerrymandering as the uh, uh, process of creatively drawing legislative district boundaries for partisan political purposes. Um, I know back before the election during the campaign time, uh, it seemed like every candidate uh, is all for um, redistricting, reform, um, wanting to eliminate gerrymandering. Um, the election's over. Uh, the Republicans are now in majority in both the House and the Senate. Uh, my question now, and I, and I guess uh, uh, Senators uh, Crouch and Bacon, you all have the uh, epitome, I guess, of 
gerrymandered districts right now in District 75 and District 78. Um, my two-part question is, first of all, you all see a difference in the um, process of redistricting this year, or is it too late to change the process? And then my um, um, second uh, question would be uh, the outcome. As far as do you see any different in the outcome of redistricting as far as do you envision uh, gerrymandered um, districts um, compared to what we have right now? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, does anyone in the audience have a different take on the same topic? Okay, seeing no hands. Uh, now it's time for the legislators to respond to that issue. And I see uh, Representative Crouch first. Thank you. Um, <coughs> the law currently provides that the maps be drawn and then approved by the House or the party that's in power. Of course, in the House that would be Republican, in the Senate it would be Republican. So there's really um, nothing in the law that requires things to be done differently. In 2006, I voted for a bill that would require a independent commission chaired by the Supreme Court Justice to actually draw the maps to present to the House um, for approval. I very much believe that is the best way to approach this, uh, but that is not the way it's going to be approached. There is a committee that is in, por in charge of that elections and apportionment. Uh, Representative Eric Cook, who's an attorney, uh, has, been, um, uh, has been asked to chair that. Uh, he's viewed by both sides, Republicans and Democrats, as being very fair and very impartial. I think that there has to be, uh, uh, the maps have to be drawn in a way where they're compact and where they, they um, comprise similar uh, geographical and uh, neighborhood values, or there will be an uproar, not only from the public, but I think from legislators, because you have to realize that just as the public is interested in those districts being fair, so are the legislators. I mean, I am very much interested in my district being pretty compact and being um, where I don't have people in one part of a county and then snake down and have people in another part of the county. So I think there's going to be a lot of internal pressure put to make sure that those maps are drawn correctly and fairly. And one of the things that this uh, election enforcement committee is going to do, uh, and they're, they're talking about doing it with the Senate, is have hearings across the state to get input from the public regarding how they envision the process to work and what is the best way for their district to look like. So I'm very hopeful that we will end up with maps that are, you know, very much, um, very much representative of what they should be. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, other responses? Uh, Representative Bagan? Uh, I'm in full agreement with uh, Representative Crouch, and he like said, because we do have the two most gerrymandered districts in southern Indiana, and uh, it was really, really difficult uh, to get around to all of them. Just, just the logistics of it, you know, I could leave from my house, which is at one corner of it, and it would take me, without crossing lines and so forth, it would take over two hours just to drive to the other side of it. And that is just... Uh, too, too large and, and too much traveling and too much to do for anyone to do that. And to be representing someone two hours away is just not uh, a very good system. I uh, <clears throat> looked at earlier in the campaign and talked to Todd Rakita, Secretary of State, and he had, had listed and actually had published what he thought using the, the rules from 10 years ago that the district should have looked like. And they would have been much more compact and, and representative of the areas and made it much, much better. So hopefully, as Representative Couch said, that we will put a lot of pressure on those people doing that. And even as freshmen, we can try to do that uh, to, to make those districts much, much more representative for, for you, the constituents. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, Re uh, Senator Thomas. Well, J.D., I tell you, um, I know how you feel about that because, like uh, Ron said, when we was campaigning, you could actually be walking on the wrong side of the street in a district, and, um, and it was really confusing for folks. It was confusing for the candidates, too, of knowing where your district lines are drawn. I never did understand uh, why it wasn't more uh, uniform and geometrical, and I hope that uh, just from the standpoint of running for office and just as a citizen out here, that uh, I hope that uh, they can come up with a better solution than what we've had before. And um, 
I, I think, I'm not sure on this, and I'm just talking now from a, a freshman, I understand my comments are from a freshman senator here, and I, there's a lot I, I've got to learn on this, but I've never understood, I guess uh, the gerrymandering part was for political um, posturing on these things. But I think today, um, for the House guys that's going to be working on this, I'm, I'm thinking today that uh, it's quite different than what it was 30 or 40 years ago when people would live, move into an area and probably live there, work there, and die there. Never move. We've got so much transition now that I'm not sure the um, Republican Democrat thing would factor in as much as it did back then. So I'm hoping that uh, the panel that does the um, study on this does keep in mind that just making uniform, I think, would make a lot of people happy. And I know for folks that run for office, it'd make them a lot happy too. So I just want to comment on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Becker. Uh Actually, my, my Senate district, thanks to Senator Server, former Senator Server, is actually pretty compact. Um, there are house districts. I mean, uh, Sue Elsperman's house district is, if you want to talk about gerrymandered, she, she runs in five counties. Um, there are some Senate districts that are five counties. I have two, so mine's pretty compact. It's Vandenberg and Warwick. Um, and I remember... Greg Server saying at the time that they were doing this, this is done every 10 years after the census. Um, and so we, we still have to have a lot of work. I mean, even if you have a commission, there's nothing that precludes that commission from being sued uh, the same way that the state legislature, that the state can be sued. And these maps, well, when I started, uh, we had multi-member districts. Uh, <coughs> Dennis Avery and I both represented the same district, but it was twice as large as a single member district. That was challenged, uh, and the Supreme Court said, no, you will have to draw single, me single member districts, and so that was done about 20 years ago. So um, these maps, regardless of what you do or how you do them, somebody's not gonna like them. Um, it, because, and I think Senator Toms is right, though, that the geographic Republican versus Democrat uh, doesn't have as much weight because people are more mobile, plus I think people are more independent voters uh, than, than they used to be as well. So hopefully whatever uh, comes up, you know, whatever we find, the, the final product, the big thing is that you're also going to see that the congressional maps, that the, the legislature also determines the U.S. congressional maps. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's going to be really uh, critical for some folks as well to see whether or not they're still in the 8th district or they're moved to the 9th district or otherwise. So, um, but even if you just had a commission, there's nothing to preclude that that commission is not going to be partisan uh, any more than the legislature is. I think the hope is that we just do it so that communities of interest uh, and compactness is is the central focus. Okay, thank you. I would ask the cameraman not to block the donuts, please. <laughs> critical, very critical. Please don't block the donuts. But I will remind you that the current district maps are on the wall. So you can see what, the, what these district maps look like right now. And of course, once that happens, we'll, uh, uh, we'll remake them. Now, and, every, and I agree, everybody's gonna have their own look at it. I mean, I would like to see districts with just me in it. <laughs> that would really, uh, that would really um, change the amount of influence that I've got. So uh, and I'm sure everybody would kind of like to be the same way. But anyway, that's going to be an interesting process. Anyway, uh, moving on to another issue. Uh, the folks on the right forfeited once. So now I'm going to ask the people on the left. People, no. Well, we got new people. Okay, so we'll move to the right again. Sorry. Anybody on the right have a guess? Uh, please step up to the microphone. And uh, state uh, your name, and then uh, you can get into your issue, please. Okay. Uh, my name's Bob Gozo. I'm here with my wife, Paul, and my son, Scott. Um, as I'm sure you know, many years ago, the state of Indiana had uh, institutions for people with disabilities. Many people were there, uh, and the state closed those down uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, including the level of care that was... Am I not turned on? Oh. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So the state uh, closed those down, uh, one of the reasons being the, the issues around the care that was given in the institutions and also the cost of 
I don't remember the exact figures, but I think it was well over $100,000 per uh, person to care for uh, someone in the state institutions. Uh, <clears throat> this year, ne or next year, um, it looks to me like the state is going to be cutting back on the amount of care that any uh, person can get in home. And uh, it's, and this is more of a comment, I don't really have a question here, I guess, but I would like to hear your thoughts on this. But it seems to me like the state is now looking to put more of the burden than ever on the parents, the caretakers uh, of people with institutions, with, uh, with disabilities. And I uh, just wondered if you had any thoughts about, uh, about how that's going and, and, and what the, you know, uh, anything can be done about that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the, the issue is you're concerned about the cutting back on in-home care for folks with disabilities. Does anyone have a different take on the same issue? Uh, seeing no hands, uh, now responses from legislators. Uh, Representative Crouch gets to go first again. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. I, I presume you're referring to that uh, uh, BOA, they call it, uh, that that formula that they're looking at <coughs> putting in place. Well, and it is my understanding, and Senator Becker, correct me if I uh, get this wrong, but that what they put out there isn't finalized, and they're seeking input. And Senator Becker and I have been very, very vocal and have had numerous occasions with, or meetings with FSSA on that very issue to ensure that there are enough supports for those people who are trying to take care of their loved ones in their home. So I appreciate you being here. I know you're uh, very vocal, and I would encourage you to also ask other people that have children with disabilities to be equally vocal um, with the administration and with their representatives so that we can prevent that from happening. Uh, thank you. Other legislators? Uh, anybody? Oh, uh, Senator Becker. Do I have to smack you? Um, <laughs> not, not yet. <laughs> Wait a minute, that was applause. I heard applause at that. <laughs> this is not going well. <laughs> Senator Becker. Thank you, Jim. Um, I appreciate, Bob, your comments because I'm, I'm very concerned about that. And Representative Crouch is, is correct. We have met numerous times. We are also in the process of setting up a webcam meeting with the governor as well as parents uh, in the community if we can get the governor's office to sign off on that. We tried to get him down for a meeting so he could hear firsthand. I think it's important for legislators to always be able uh, to put a face to an issue so that they truly understand how it impacts people's lives. And, um, you know, there, there was a hearing, as you all know, uh, ARC, ARC hosted the, the hearing during our meeting with us and, and the candidates during this last uh, election. And uh, there's a lot of concern about the cuts being made. I know that uh, we have submitted information from parents to uh, FSSA, and I know you may know, you probably know Caitlin Thompson. And Caitlin is a very bright young lady, and she um, did her homework on how the proposed rules would affect her. And uh, we have now heard back that they're not going to implement the way they originally said. But then when I emailed her the information, she had some other questions, which were, I think, very legitimate questions. And that only comes from people who can tell you directly how it's going to impact them. And that's why I think it's it's important. You know, we were told um, about the cuts made to. Uh, I think my mic just went off. I think it did too. No. Is it on? Am I on? Okay. Uh, so we're going to continue to look at this, but I I would encourage you to be vigilant because, you know, the state originally before they closed institutions. Uh, they said that they were going to use that money, that all that money would go to help families. And unfortunately, that's not been the case. A lot of it's just gone to reduce the budget. So uh, I think we need to uh, continue to be vigilant. It's not going to be easy in this environment. But, you know, 
what happens if you don't have those support, now I hear it, if you don't have those support services for families is that you just force parents and, and uh, their children to place children in institutions where it will be much more expensive for the state in the long run. Plus, it's not the best care in most cases. There are some cases where institutions are the best option for that particular family, but we want to ensure that as much as possible that families have their children with them uh, to provide those services. Uh, thank you. Other legislator responses? Uh, Representative Bacon. Uh, well, I just want to say one thing as a newly elected re uh, legislator. Uh, I want you to keep informing us, keep knocking at my door, keep letting me know what's going on and, and what your feelings are, because we don't know. We're not as astute as our colleagues up here who have been here for a few years, and we're going to rely on them to keep us informed, and we need to be informed by you also. So please keep doing that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I know you will. Thank you. Uh, Senator Tom. Well, just briefly, I, you know, I know that, uh, like we all talked about, the uh, money's going to be tight and everybody's looking to make cuts, but I hope that uh, that folks don't get lost in the shuffle on this thing. I hope that when they start looking on this budget, that uh, I've always felt that I hope that they look to see where money's being wasted. And we, we make t if we correct that, and I think there's some correction can be made on that. Uh, I'm, I'm brand new here, but I just got a feeling that this is a, this is a business like the other things. There's times that if you look this thing over, you'll find that maybe your expenditures are going out the windows where they shouldn't be. I hope that um, in this process that uh, they can clear, you know, they can make corrections on the way our revenues are, are being spent so that individuals in cases like uh, what you're talking about here don't get lost and get, get feel the brunt of this, uh, these cuts and these budget cuts they're talking about. So I just want to let you know I'm sympathetic to that too. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next issue and to my left and I see a gentleman right here. Uh, Yes, please step up to the microphone and uh, uh, state your uh, name and then uh, get into your issue, please. Uh, my name is Ray Brown. I'm the uh, president of the Evansville Retired Federal Employees. Uh, my issue is tax parity. Uh, you, most of you probably don't realize that there are three different tax uh, groups uh, for retired people. The, Railroad uh, uh, retirees are taxed at, uh, have a uh, tax deduction of, I'm not sure about this number, I, I'm gonna say like over 30,000 that they can make without, and uh, Social Security, that that group is around 18,000, I think, that, that they uh, can deduct. And the uh, civil servants, and, and like in my case, uh, can deduct two thousand dollars so we're uh, asking for just parity with social the social security group is, is what we'd like to have and we have had uh, bills up uh, year after year but they always you know uh, don't seem to have the money or the will to, to uh, equalize the, the tax uh, uh, taxes on, on retired groups and as a result of this uh, there are a lot of federal employees and, and policemen and teachers who when they retire move out of this state where because there are any number of other states where the, where they do have tax parity including Illinois Kentucky and Michigan which is not very far away uh, and so the state is then losing all of the uh, revenue that that uh, those retired people would have uh, contributed uh, for the you know after retirement, and they don't move back to this state either. If they you know like in my case, I lived in several different states, but I did retire in Indiana and I lived here, so that's the reason I'm still here. Otherwise, I'd be in Florida or Arizona or, or someplace like that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, responses from, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Is there anyone that has a different take on the tax parity issue? Uh, seeing no hands, uh, responses from legislators. This time, we're going to start with Senator Tomes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it a dollar later. 
Um, <clears throat> I was just talking to you about that a while ago, Ray. You know, that's something I, uh, I learned uh, years ago when in transportation industry, as we talked about, that uh, there was people that retired from transportation in, in his area that worked here in Evansville. And before they retired, they had it set up, their home bought and everything, to move to Kentucky just for that reason, to avoid paying taxes on their uh, pension. And um, it's, it's something that my, my wife and I have talked about for, for, uh, for off and on for over the years. I've wondered why um, Indiana wouldn't look at that uh, because, as you said, when those individuals leave this area, they take their pension money with them and they take their spending power with them too. And I think it's something that <clears throat> I'd like to see if that discussion comes up um, or a bill comes up, I'd like to at least present that uh, case what you're talking about where, um, you know, I know it's money's tight. I know that they're looking, you know, talking about uh, reducing taxes or, or, or eliminating taxes on something like that was probably not going to fly too well. But there's prospects of that too that needs to be considered is the fact that if you maintain those people and they retain here in this state, in this city, so does their, their spending and, um, and their, their property taxes, their homes they buy. So um, it's a good point that you made. It's something that's been on my mind for a few years, uh, as I said. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, next is uh, Representative Crouch. Yes. Thank you, Ray. I'm glad you decided to retire here and you're with us still. Um, that is the same argument that we hear from other groups, veterans. You know, there's been bills to try to, you know, exempt veterans from income tax uh, because other states do. Uh, unfortunately, this year, um, that's probably very a dim outlook on getting anything like that passed because it actually will take money away from the state. However, I think it's important that you are tenacious and you keep after it and you keep working that issue because there will be a point in time where we will have more money. And the longer your issue is out there, the greater your likelihood of being recognized when that does change and happen. Oftentimes at the legislature, you will see issues every year. And it takes a number of years a lot of times in order for them to actually get approved. So thank you for your tenaciousness. We're all, I believe, open and receptive to what you're proposing, it just is going to be very difficult. Uh, thank you. Other legislators to respond? Uh, Senator Becker. I appreciate you being here, and I appreciate the, the information. You've done a lot of research on it, and that's helpful. And I think, really, it's been said, the issue is, do you, do you know, I can't rem remember now, but do you know what the fiscal impact to the state on, on this proposal would be? Uh, Ray. Uh, Senator Lansky has had uh, this bill for several years, uh, and there has been an impact statements. Uh, uh, and I don't remember right off hand. You have a copy of her bill here. Okay, if she's got, it should be on the back, the very last page if the fiscal is attached. I was just curious as to, because I know that these bills have been introduced in the House. I mean, the House always, they are responsible for introducing taxation changes. It has to really start in the House. Um, but I do know, and, and I would just echo what uh, Representative Crouch has said, that, that continue to be vigilant and to provide information. I doubt that anything will happen this year if there's a very large fiscal or any fiscal, because right now we're in the hole. But I do think that you should be treated fairly and equitably with other retirees in the state of Indiana. And I agree with your philosophy that I, I do think that we need, Indiana needs to be a state that's looked to as attractive for retirees. And currently it's not. So I appreciate your input and we'll continue to be vigilant on the issue. Uh, thank you. Uh, we are ready to move on to another issue. And so it's time for the people on this side. See uh, right here in the front, uh, please step up to the microphone and uh, uh, state your name and you can get right into your issue. My name is Deborah Constable. My issue is with CPS costs and Arlen workers. I had grandchildren that are in foster care and CPS had came to me seven months ago to adopt them. One of them is special needs and she requires a lot of physical therapy. While all this is going on with her in and out of foster care, 
CPS has argued with me about going through classes and everything. And I've done the foster care, the kinship, adoption, and everything. Now, all of a sudden, a month ago, they come to me and say, they changed their mind. They don't want me to adopt my grandchildren. They have another family that would like that. Okay, so as a, a CPS worker, who do I file a complaint with? I've asked that. They have a team that nobody's ever even heard of. And who is on the team? All the CPS workers. I mean, the big issue is here, grandparents have no rights because the grandchildren were born out of wedlock. But that's still not my issue. My issue is my granddaughter is special needs. My daughter and the father has signed consent for me to adopt. But everything's been put on lockdown because of the CPS worker has a disagreement with me. Okay, well, I don't care about your disagreement. It's all about the children. I mean, I was there for, and I have a bond. I have my 16-year-old granddaughter with me, and she's, been, she's one of 12 grandchildren. And she could, can tell you about all the bonds I have with all my grandchildren. I mean, I, my issue is, is somebody needs to look into, like, the foster cares. Because seven months ago, my granddaughter was doing fine with physical and occupational therapy. Now today, they're teaching her sign language. She had cranial surgery up in Indianapolis, and which I love Indianapolis Children's Riley's Hospital. Her foster parent just left her there because it was a Mother's Day weekend, and she had to get back to Evansville with her family. Okay, I'm a mother too, but that little baby needed a familiar face, a familiar voice while her, her skull was being cut open, you know? And where do I come in at? I mean, I'm her grandmother. So, I mean, my issue is her medical. Now they're teaching her sign language. Just four months ago when I had seen the child, she was crawling all over my floor. I have her on video camera. She's a mimicker. She likes to mimic everybody. But now they're teaching her sign language and she's off into visitation with another family. Now I'm just locked out of everything. And her medical issue with me is she's going backwards. Just like the four-year-old grandson. He's still in diapers. Why? He was, when he was coming to see me, he was in underwear. So my issue is with the CPS workers, the CASA workers, and the Arlen workers. I mean, the Arlen worker, uh, the CASA worker was at my house and took the special needed child in the middle of a conflict with police and everything outside of my house. Now, what kind of Arlen worker or CASA worker would do that? And then when I complained to the CPS lady, she told me, I will deal with it because I have no rights. So my issue is, okay. is with this, the children that are in the foster cares. I've been to the foster care. The, I love the people to death. They take good care of my grandchildren. But where do I come in? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the issue is the uh, grandparent inability to adopt a foster care child. Does anyone have a different take on the same topic? Seeing uh, none, response from legislators. <laughs> Representative Crouch, you get to go first again. I, I, if you could just contact your representative or senator. I, I, they can intercede and try to get something resolved for you. Of course, you know, when you're dealing with Department of Child Services, a lot of times they will tell us that they can't give us information because it's confidential. But have you contacted? Do you know who your rep is and your senator? Have you contacted them? I even had the parents give consent mm -hmm. to express the case and the children, the mother and the father, and I have the papers with <coughs> Anybody coming to get information for the children about their case, but I'm just told to deal with it because nobody wants to go up against CPS. Mm -hmm. And CPS is Child Protective Services. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd be happy to take the information, see what I can do, what I can find out um, on your behalf. I'll be happy to do that if you want to get that to me. Um, I, I don't know what else I can offer to do, but I can do that. And we, uh, on upon occasion, have been successful in intervening on behalf of uh, constituents, so. I know it's overwhelming yeah. in Vandenberg County with CPS and UPS and everything. There's a lot of children in and out of foster care. Mm -hmm. And they talk about reunification a lot. These two children that's been in foster care haven't even seen their other brother. And I've asked CASA, please, can you just get them to visit with each other? Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, Senator Tomes. Well, I just, I just, uh, I don't know a lot about that either, other than uh, our oldest daughter and her husband have foster care for several years, and they've been involved in that program. Um, I, I just, just would say this that I, I think there's been some legislation over the past several years about uh, giving, granting grandparents and great grandparents 
uh, more rights in these matters, I think. And I believe there's something maybe coming up. This, I'm not sure, but I, I got something just the other day on that matter. And so um, apparently there's, there's uh, some, someone that's looking into uh, maybe perhaps introducing some more language on that again. But uh, just, just to let you know about that I, I am aware there are some situations on that. Okay, uh, thank you. Other, uh, Senator Becker. When you say Arlen, are you talking about Arlen Luzio? Is that? Yes, ma'am. Okay, because I do know that uh, right now there is a lawsuit that's been filed uh, against the state um, on behalf of a, a foster and adoptive parents. I'm not sure which one. I just had a meeting um, just this week in Indianapolis with um, Hill, not Hillcrest, but the United Methodist Home, uh, because they're, they have some concerns about the children that live there receiving treatment, and it was brought up that there is a lawsuit by either foster parents or adoptive parents or both. Um, if you, you know, if you will email or just give us a copy of it, uh, what Representative Crouch said, I mean, we, we certainly will look into it. I don't know who your state representative is now because, of course, all the, a lot of, there's a lot of changes or who your state senator is. I know I haven't been contacted on it, but I would certainly be happy to look into it. But we are, there's not, you know, we do run a, into issues, you know, used to with FSSA and all the problems that we had with FSSA. I could call and I could find out about a case uh, immediately or when I say immediately, at least within a week. Now I'm told, uh, because of all the work that we did to try to expose the, the problems with the new process, that now the parents have to sign uh, a document saying that the state can release information to me. And that's kind of difficult to do if, if somebody doesn't. I mean, if they don't have email, uh, it's real difficult, um, especially during the session when we're in Indianapolis. But we will certainly be happy to look at that because it, I know that there's a concern. I had received one email from another uh, parent that has a special needs child and they're very concerned about some of the cuts uh, in services for their children. And when you adopt a special needs child, historically you were able to have, I mean, that, that child usually needs a lot of special attention, medical attention, and that the whole idea was to encourage more adoptions and to provide that help because not everybody wants wants to adopt a special needs child. It takes a lot of work and a lot of effort and so um, that was an incentive. So certainly if there's something, if you want to email us or give us a copy of your information, we'll certainly look into it for you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Representative uh, Bacon. I just want to say the same as what they've said here. We need to know. You know, when you're here doing that, and that's what we what we want and what we need to find out about, because we don't know unless you tell us, especially the, us new ones. And so just keep us informed, and uh, we will do everything we can to help you. But it'll be a slower process for us, because we'll, we're line, learning our way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to another issue. But first, John, can you do me a big favor? Give me some water, please. Thanks much. Do you do windows? <laughs> not for <Jim>. <laughs> <laughs> no, from the other the other way, not from not bathroom water, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> kitchen water. <laughs> uh, drinking fountain is okay too, though. Thank you. Uh, next, we're on this side of the room. I see a lady. Uh, please uh, step up to the microphone and um, uh, state your name, and then you can get right into your issue. My name's Mary Bennett. I'm speaking on behalf of the American Physical Therapy Association. And I think I've spoken to most of the legislators independently, but I just wanted to um, say to them that um, congratulations on the people who have just won election for the first time and people who have um, also been re-elected. Um, we are um, going to once again introduce legislation for direct access for physical therapists. We're really one of the only rehab professionals who don't have um, ability for patients to be able to come to us without having a doctor's referral. Occupational therapists don't have that need. Speech therapists don't have that need. Um, and in uh, 48 of the states, physical therapists don't have to have a physician's referral. Um, so Indiana and Alabama are the only two states without this need. Um, it, it doesn't cost anything. In fact, the studies have looked at um, there are cost savings involved when patients can go to see a physical therapist without a doctor first. 
Um, so I'm just asking for support and to remind them we do have a reception at the Rehabilitation Center on Bellmead on December the 1st at 5.30 in the evening um, when a lot of physical therapists and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk to the legislators individually. I'd also want to say just quickly that Gail Regan also had another commitment um, before she knew this date, so she was unable to be here today. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Issue being uh, to support eliminating a um, referral requirement for physical therapy. Does anyone have a different take on the same uh, topic? Thank you, John. Seeing none, uh, responses from legislators. I just got a question. Yes. Mary, uh, I know you said you're going to email me, that, but uh, could you give me the address on Bell Mead? Just do you, do you have that? Do that. It's right behind St. Mary's. I think it's 3701 Bell Mead. Okay. I think that's the Correct address on Bellamy, right behind um, St. Mary's. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, you have anything else, Senator? No, that was all. Oh, Just okay. A question. I'm sorry. I'm other sorry. other responses from legislators. Okay. Well, uh, Senator Buck, you didn't don't have to hit me. <laughs> I know you want to. Maybe you know. just a, a little history because I know uh, Mary's been at this a long time. Uh, and the opposition comes from chiropractors as well as physicians. I mean, that's, um, that's where the opposition has come from in the past. Um, and I think just pointing out to legislators um, the difference in occupational therapy and speech therapists not having uh, to have a, a physician, physician's referral, that's, that's probably good information to provide as well. And, and um, I think I think it's something it's something that I've supported for a long time the direct access I think it will cut medical costs and so I think it anything we can do that helps people with their health care issues uh, that also saves money is something that we ought to be looking at very carefully uh, thank you other responses um, Representative uh, Bacon. As a member of the healthcare field for the last 43 years, I definitely agree with Mary and will do everything I can to help pursue that because as, as Senator Becker said, it's something that's not gonna cost us and we really need to be looking at those types of issues and if it can save us money and prove it to everybody else, we need to look at it even harder. So uh, I, I appreciate you bringing it to our attention and thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. We're ready to move on to the next issue and we're on this side of the room again. See right here. Um, uh, in the in the middle, uh, please step up to the microphone. Uh, state your name, and then you can get right into your issue. Roger Madden, Evansville, and it's uh, visitation rights enforcement. Uh, congratulations to the two new elected senators, reps. Uh, I've been. Working on this issue for 21 years here in Evansville, Vandenberg County, Warwick, Gibson, and I haven't got any help from anywhere from county, state, federal, governors, or attorney generals. So since um, Senator Toms is pro-life, and since that comes under the First Amendment, and since all of our elected representatives have sworn an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of Indiana and of the United States, and since both of them require enforcement of our First Amendment right to assemble, uh, I'd like for the new elected representatives to contact the governor and the attorney general and look into why the counties do not enforce visitation rights just like they enforce child support. They found that if you enforce visitation, you get a 90% pay rate on child support, and that with our economic problems and welfare, et cetera. Child, they've known since 1984 when they did the Governor's <coughs> Commission on Child Support that, and visitation enforcement and parental involvement, that when you enforce child uh, visitation, you get a 90% pay rate on child support. That turns over seven times in the community. Back in 1984, they collected $12 million and it equated to $84 million in the state. So. We've been talking about all the economic cuts, the uh, retirees' taxes being taken. If you don't take their taxes and they can spend that money, that money turns over seven times in the community. So we're just looking for equal protection because uh, there's 20,000 kids being denied visitation in Vandenberg County. That's 20,000 fathers, 
40,000 grandparents, 10,000 stepmothers. So if it's a man-woman issue, uh, the women against enforcing visitation just screwed over 10,000 stepmothers and 20,000 step-grandparents. And there's 20,000 aunts or uncles involved and 20,000 friends from when these kids are taken out of their old neighborhood. That affects 170,000 people out of a county that only has about 200,000 people. I'd say that's a pretty big constitutional rights violation. So, uh, like I said, in the past 20 years, I haven't got any help. And uh, Senator Becker said it's better to keep the family, the kids with the families. Well, I'd like to see the same thing happen after divorce. Equal protection of the laws, 14th Amendment. It's in the Indiana and the U.S. constitutions and the federal laws. And if they don't enforce the visitation rights, the states and counties are supposed to lose their federal funding. Okay, uh, thank you. The issue is uh, wanting visitation rights uh, enforced. Is there anyone with a different take on the same topic? Seeing none, a response from, uh, uh, from legislators and Senator Thomas first. Uh, thanks, Roger. I, I tell you what, you know, um, <clears throat> my family, a very tight-knit family, and um, we raised three full-grown children now, and we got grandbabies. And I can't imagine, whatever the circumstances would be, that I wouldn't be able to visit with my little ones. I, I just couldn't deal with that. So I can understand uh, the, the heartache that parents and grandparents have got to be enduring in this kind of situations. I don't know all of the aspects and all the legalities of why we're, where we're at now in this. But um, I do know, like I said, I got an email this week from uh, someone who was talking about this issue. It was concerning grandparents and great-grandparents, but this would, as, as this comes up, it's going to include all parents that's involved with this and, and, and uh, those that are closely associated with those children. I'm sure that um, there's going to be some movement made on these kind of things. I, I certainly hope so. I feel like uh, the time's come that we address this here, that, that uh, parents and the grandparents and great-grandparents um, aren't denied access to the, their uh, grandchildren or their children. And um, if there's anything that I can do in this process, I'd be more than willing and happy to be part of it. I just want you to know that. Okay. I, like I said, I've got a lot to learn on this, but in these kind of matters, um, again, I, I just couldn't imagine how that would be not to be able to visit with their children when, uh, in, a, in a case of a divorce or a breakup or whatever, you know, that um, they wouldn't be able to have that uh, wonderful ex experience of, of being with their children. So just want you to know that. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Other uh, legislators? Uh, Representative Bacon. Um, Roger and I have talked about this before also in, in during the campaign and so forth, and it's something we definitely need to learn more about and find the reasons why. I think the election process that we just went through is going to change some things, and uh, hopefully we'll continue doing that. We'll work with you to do that. So thank you. Yeah, and the paperwork I gave Jim Toms is uh, 1985 special legislation by Indiana for grandparents' visitation rights enforcement. So that's, uh, what, 15, <clears throat> 25 years of constitutional rights violations since the law was passed. Okay. Uh, other legislators? Okay. Uh, seeing none, uh, Thanks, we Roger. will move to uh, the next issue, and we're back on this side of the room. See the gentleman right out here in the middle? Uh, uh, please step up to the microphone, and you can state your name and get into your issue. But actually, while he's doing that, one of the things I would recommend, you can mm -hmm. keep, come forward. The, one of the things I recommend people doing, if you have an issue or want to contact your legislators, it's a good idea to write some of the particulars of that particular issue down along with your name and contact information from you. That helps the legislators get a handle on the particular issue and know who to contact to follow up with it. Um, so that's a good way to, it's, it's always a good idea to put your issue uh, your question or your desires in writing and hand that to the legislators. Uh, okay, go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, my name is Steve Smith, and my topic is education reform. And um, I'll just have to say uh, sort of a comment. I'm, I'm very concerned and disturbed about some of these uh, recommendations by Dr. Bennett on education reform, uh, specifically <coughs> using test scores as a proxy for teacher performance and also uh, ranking our schools, teachers, and students on a bell curve regardless of how well they perform. And uh, also, I'd also recommend to everyone on the panel uh, to read the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation white paper on education reform, and they strongly recommended not using test scores as a proxy 
for teacher performance exclusively. Uh, some of the unintended consequences, uh, they don't identify the problems that the teachers have with their practices and methods and what kinds of learning issues the child has. Uh, teachers will only want to teach in the rich and powerful schools and ignore the poor schools. Uh, teachers and administrators will be tempted to game the system so they can look good as far as their performance. Uh, we were warned about the privatization of uh, FFA, FFSA, and so please, please beware of privatization of our schools before you go forward. I know we have underperforming schools. I know I'm married to a teacher. Uh, I know there are bad teachers out there. They're lazy teachers. But I really don't think using test scores to, to rank our students and our teachers is a way to root these lazy or bad or underperforming schools out. So that's my issue. Okay, uh, thank you. The issue is the concern about using test scores uh, for teacher evaluation and education reform. It, does anyone have a different take on the same topic? Uh, seeing none, a response from legislators. Representative Crouch. Thanks, Steve. I, I, I think you raise a very valid point. Um, there has to be some measure uh, put in place to rate teachers, good teachers, bad teachers, good performing schools, bad performing schools. And the point that you raise that is so valid is you can't just depend totally on test scores because it's proven that parents' involvement helps children in school. But what about the children that don't have parents or the parents aren't involved or it's a single mother working evenings? Or, so there has to be some kind of measure in that to recognize that not every child comes to the table equally. Um, so I do, uh, I, I, I do agree with you. I think that's a very valid point, and um, thank you for raising it. And we're just going to have to work hard to make sure that that is um, part of the formula by which we move forward on. Uh, Representative Bacon. Steve, I'd also like to, uh, as a coach for 24 years, uh, I did not teach, but I was around the students uh, for that long. Uh, quite a bit of the time, and, and I did have two children that went through the public school system, so I'm well aware of what happens. We do need to find other ways, though, to evaluate our teachers and to bring a reform to our schools because the system we have now is not working. And, and I've been there, and I've seen what it takes to get rid of bad teachers, and it's, it's practically impossible. And we went through that situation. You know, and I had a straight-A student who the teacher said just couldn't be taught. And, you know, it's just uh, ridiculous answers at times. But that teacher was still there, you know, 25 years and just said that that student could not be taught. So there's systems that have to be put in place. I agree with you that test scores are not the only way to do that. And we need to have other systems to do that. But we need to reform our system and bring it up to what needs to be done. So but I appreciate it. We will definitely work on that. We haven't seen what's coming forward yet. So we'll have to wait and see what they're going to bring to us and work with them with Dr. Bennett. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, next was uh, Senator Tong. Yeah, Steve, you know, during the campaign, I, I visited several of the schools and talked to some of the teachers and the students, and, and uh, that's an issue that everybody's got some, some uh, input on. they got something, some comments on it. Um, <coughs> what was interesting was that, um, you know, the, the, the teacher, I know, seems like that's the focal point. Whatever the schools are doing, it's, it, it always comes back to the teacher. I do think that you've got to have some kind of a program that you can rate these teachers and separate, as you said, the good from the bad, because it definitely aren't going to have to remove these incompetent teachers, so that we do have uh, teachers that are um, have the ability to uh, instruct and promote a good education. But also, the comments we heard a lot of from a lot of the teachers and the, and the students themselves was the parents, the home. It, it, it does start there. And, and, you know, as individuals, we all have a responsibility, too, to not always rely on government, but we have a share in this ourselves. We all have to take up on our own uh, obligations on this. And uh, there's a failing there. And, and you, can't, you can't solve a problem without recognizing all of the things that impact that problem. That's one of them. And that's, that's from the people that are involved in that industry, the teachers and the, and the students. And also the, the thing that we heard a lot was um, administrations. Uh, the administration levels of these schools and, and the either that they're not working with the teachers or, or they're, not, uh, they're not performing as they should. And it, and it puts a teacher in a position uh, that takes the heat on uh, the outcome of, uh, of these 
test scores and graduation rates of these schools. So everybody connected has, has some part to play in making our education system, bringing America back up to the standard where it once was. I think America right now, educational-wise, ranks like uh, of the 36 industrialized nations, we rank right in the middle, you know, 16, somewhere along in there. In Indiana, I don't know, the last time I seen was uh, we rank about uh, midway in the country on, uh, on education here in Indiana. And I just know, looking at the test scores in Evansville that was printed in the paper of the I-STEPs uh, was startling to me to see some of those scores. So there's, there's a lot of work to be done, but everybody's got to be involved in this thing. So, and, and you know, there, there has to be some things in play that, that you can use to um, remove teachers that are not doing the job and open the door for a good qualified teacher to take that slot. Uh, can I, uh, uh, yeah. I, I, feel that I think there are some ways, for instance, like a peer review or administrative review or whatever. My, my main issue, though, is just the exclusivity right. of using testing. No, you can't. No, you can't just okay. go by one. No, absolutely okay. not. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Senator Becker? I appreciate your input, Steve. Uh, I agree with you that test scores cannot be the only measurement that is used uh, to rate teachers. And, and you know, I think what's unfortunate is that there is nothing to rate parents. Uh, you know? Uh, and I, I do think that that's where the responsibility lies in ensuring that kids come to school prepared. If we had you know, if we could be guaranteed that every child that comes to school is equally as bright, equally uh, exposed to society, to plays, to music, to whatever, uh, but that, that is not the case, and unfortunately. And um, I think there needs to be something done to ensure that parents bring kids ready to school to be taught. And we do nothing in that area. I mean, we try, you know, schools try to encourage. They have parent-teacher conferences. Um, and I think, unfortunately, what we have seen within our schools, and I see an awful lot of teachers that are demoralized right now uh, because they have had so much thrown at them. They are now the babysitter, the doctor, the nurse, uh, the social worker, everything. If there's a problem, it's it's dropped in their lap. And I think uh, schools are being told to do more with less. And um, I'm very concerned about that. So I, I don't, I agree that test scores should not be uh, the only measurement of a teacher's success. And there are ways to get rid of bad teachers if the administrators document a poor teacher. They have to be willing to document it. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're ready to move on to uh, the next issue, and we're on this side of the room. Uh, yes, John, uh, please uh, step up to the microphone, uh, say your name, and you can get right into your issue. My name is John Blair. I am uh, live in Evansville. I, I am really curious. I haven't heard anything out of any, any virtually anyone about the, the scandal that is breaking forth with the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission, with the Office of Consumer Counselor, with the fact that that we have this revolving door between state agencies and the that are supposed to regulate business and the businesses that they're supposed to regulate, uh, the most recent example probably is the uh, new person that was just hired in a senior position at, at the Indiana Department of Environmental Management that uh, was a was a coal person, and now he's telling Region Five of EPA that that Indiana, because it supposedly has some kind of statute, uh, that we are not supposed to be regulated under the Clean Water Act that was passed in 1970 by the United States government. Uh, but this scandal that's happened with the IUIC is, is just, you know, it seems to be systemic. Uh, and it doesn't particularly apply to any one party, but in this particular instance, uh, the administrative law judge that was signing, signing off on all these rate increases for the Edwardsport power plant, uh, he, he was doing it all the way up until July, uh, started applying for a job in April with Duke Energy where he was signing off. And yes, 
Hardy, the former commissioner of the IURC, has been fired, and the, and the governor took quick, decisive action on that. But the fact is that Mr. Storms actually went before the State Ethics Commission, and they said, oh, everything's fine. You can just, you can just go right to work for Duke Energy as, as an assistant counsel, and everything's fine. Why on earth would an ethics commission do that uh, and say that, that somebody who's been actually determining who could speak and who couldn't at hearings and things like that uh, go directly to work for the company that he was signing off on? And what's happened at the Duke Edwardsport plant? When it was first proposed, the two of you who were around at that point, uh, they were talking about a billion dollar plant that would do carbon capture and sequestration and it was clean coal. Uh, now there's no carbon capture and sequestration. The price has gone from a billion dollars at that point to three billion dollars, and it's all being paid for immediately by ratepayers in the Duke Service Territory, which is 69 central Indiana counties. Uh, the same thing is happening down here. The Office of Consumer Counselor has been in completely in agreement, in fact, just signed a settlement to allow it to go to three billion dollars. Uh, but the same thing is down here. We don't have the, the coziness between the utilities that are regulated, you know, is going to result in, in even increased electrical rates and for veteran customers here. And there's a lot of people that can't afford it now. And what's that going to do for our economic development in the future if, if we charge some of the highest electric rates and we continue to depend upon coal and if there is ever global warming legislation passed, you know, we're going to be in serious trouble economically. Uh, thank you. Uh, the issue is the uh, uh, too cozy relationship and a revolving door between essentially the regulated community and regulators. Does anyone have a different take on the same topic? Uh, seeing none, a response from legislators. Uh, Representative Crouch. <laughs> You get to go first again. You know, maybe we need to replace those members on the Ethics Committee. Do you know who makes those appointments? Well, I think we need to look into that. I think that's a very valid point. Because if, if the Ethics Committee couldn't see the, um, the conflict there, then I think we need new members on that committee, for sure. Well, the Office of the Utility Consumer Counselor is supposed to represent business, industrial, and residential ratepayer interest. And here they are signing off, too, on, on one of the most massive rate increases that's ever happened in the state of Indiana. It's, it's just beyond the pale, as far as I'm concerned. Other legislator responses? I just got uh, some questions, if I can ask. Sure, uh, uh, Senator Tom's next. Yes. Um, just curious, the uh, regulatory board, and that's appointed, isn't it? Uh, yes, it's appointed. Uh, it's appointed by the governor, and it's uh, it's made up of five people, and and I think that three of them can be from the governor's party, and two of them have to be from the opposing party. Now, was there ever a discussion? I'm just asking these questions because I'm just not sure. familiar with this um, about electing those those people. Or would that would, would that change anything? And I, that's just a question I got to ask. You know, I I could I'm for democratic kind of theory in almost everything. But if, if Duke Energy, Citizens Gas, Vectran are the people who can pump literally millions of dollars into an election campaign mm -hmm. to elect a public service commission or, or an Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission, nobody's going to win yeah. on that. So if, there, if it does become elected, you know, somebody's going to have to say, well, who can fund these candidates and how does that work? Mm -hmm. uh, a nonpartisan race isn't, isn't an issue either, I don't think. But, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that, that might be the case, but you know, Indiana has pretty much rubber stamped everything the utilities have wanted for years. And like I said, it doesn't matter which party's in power, uh, it, it happens because the utilities and their attendant interests uh, interest are, are so exceptionally powerful. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, other, uh, uh, Senator Becker. I think, John, if you will email some of that information, I, I, I do have to applaud the governor for taking decisive action on the issue, but I do agree with what Representative Crouch has said. If the Ethics Commission didn't see that there was a conflict of interest, then I think we need a new Ethics Commission. Uh, but I don't know how they're appointed or who appoints them or the process within that, but if you would just uh, email me some information, I'd be happy to look into that. I, I, uh, I would share the concern that you just raised. 
typically I'm for elected offices, but I would be very concerned if we start to elect um, the IURC because I think the utilities would be the ones funding the, those candidates. Uh, and, you know, and if you said no utilities could fund it, all that would happen is that those utility executives would give their personal money to somebody else to fund it. And there are ways around every every election law. So, uh, and I also, uh, I, I'm very disturbed that the OUCC has signed off on a $3 billion rate increase. I know they haven't determined veterans rate increase proposal yet. Um, I know I did send an email six months ago or during the session uh, in opposition to veterans rate increase uh, because I don't, don't feel like at this time that they, um, that, that it was justified. But, um, but I didn't go out and make a big deal out of it. I just did it. So if you will email me that information, I'll be happy uh, to look into the commission. I don't, I don't really know. Uh, my guess is that the governor makes those appointments, but I don't know that for sure. I'll that be would happy be my to guess too. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we will move on to the next issue. What happened in this last election and the financing of the campaign just kind of was not real healthy for our democracy, I don't think. And um, if Indiana has campaign finance laws, uh, I would ask that you look at them and see if, if there's a way to make this a healthier, less expensive process. The millions and millions of dollars going into these campaigns, think of the good that money could do, you know. Think of the people that it could serve and how it could better Indiana if, if it wasn't so much money involved in this. And the number two issue, I know this isn't probably the time in Indiana's history to bring it up with this budget coming up, but I would ask that the state legislature begin considerations and discussions on reestablishing passenger train service yeah, to yeah, Evansville. Just, yeah, we'll do one issue at a time. Okay. Thank you. I just did two. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we're not going to count the second one. Uh, you may have another chance for the second one. We've got a few minutes left. So the issue is a concern about um, improper uh, campaign uh, finance looking for reform. Does anybody have a different take on the same issue? Yes. I say put a limit on the amount of money to be spent on one campaign. Okay. Both parties. Okay. Have a certain amount of money. <clears throat> okay. A any other slightly different take on the same issue? Uh, yes. We just had a uh, ruling by the Supreme Court recently that said uh, money is part of freedom of speech. Okay. Thank you for that comment. Uh, now, oh, the comment was that the uh, U.S. Supreme Court uh, uh, just made a ruling uh, that finance, uh, financing campaigns and the spending of that money to finance a campaign is free speech. That, that was the comment. Uh, are there any responses from legislators? Uh, Representative Bacon first. Good, I get to go first. <clears throat> uh, there are, uh, Roberta, there are campaign finance laws and all of us who have run, especially the state candidates, uh, and I'm sure the local also, are, are well aware of those laws because, you know, that's the, as you're running a campaign, if you do something wrong, you can go to jail pretty quick for that. And it's a lot easier to get you for that than a, a number of other things. But there are a number of campaign finance laws on the books of what you can uh, legally accept from individuals and businesses and organizations and so forth. And the reporting of those at certain times and, and certain amounts. And it gets pretty strenuous at the very end because you, you have to do it basically on a daily basis when it's really coming up at that point. So your treasurer has to be pretty good. Uh, I was going to bring up uh, the information the Supreme Court did uh, state that, that money is a First Amendment right. So uh, as far as trying to change it t to do that, that would have to be a Supreme Court thing. And I think we are not going to be able to do that. I don't disagree with you that there's too much money spent, but that is the way that our system is, and that's what we have at this point. And uh, it's going to take a lot of uh, time and a lot of energy to change that system because our democracy allows us to do so. Thank you. Good. Uh, thank you. Uh, next is uh, Representative Crouch. Back in 2000, I think it was seven, I filed a bill to uh, 
to in, it was campaign finance reform bill, and what it did was if you spend money, if you're a group that spends money on a candidate, <laughs> then you have to file that report with the Secretary of State like we all do, which it doesn't happen now. The thing I guess that concerns me the most is not the spending of the money, but knowing who's spending the money. And there are a lot of people out there spending a lot of money, and we have no idea who they are as the public. You know, the people that are being influenced by that money, we have no idea who's spending it. So didn't get a hearing. <laughs> My bill didn't get a hearing. I do know that um, a Representative Mark Mesmer from Jasper is going to be filing a bill this session, so we'll have to see if there's any better success in getting that through the process than I had back in 07. Uh, but I think it's a good point. Uh, thank you. Uh, next is Senator Thomas. I'll probably get uh, um, called out of order here, but on your second <laughs> question, I like trains. <laughs> we'll talk to you later about that. Okay. 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 Well, I didn't call you out of order. <laughs> uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, Senator Becker. Well, regarding campaign finance uh, reform, I think, you know, the Supreme Court has has ruled on that issue. There are things that Indiana could do, but uh, neither party wants to do them. Uh, I have filed, a, for several years, I filed uh, putting limits on uh, PAC contributions. There are no limits in Indiana on PAC contributions. There are limits on what, what on corporations can give uh, and labor unions, but there's no limits on individuals or on PACs. Now there are congressional, within a congressional race, that the limits are different because they're federal. But um, it's, uh, it's not likely to happen, unfortunately, because neither party wants to give up the money. Uh, I would like to see it happen. I think there is too much money spent. I think campaigns, uh, we ought to look to Britain, possibly they limit the time in which people can campaign as well as the amount of money. Uh, but seeing that happen, I don't see it happening overnight because the federal law the, that uh, John McCain supported was overturned uh, and the Supreme Court has ruled, as the gentleman back there indicated, that it is First Amendment rights. So I doubt that, you know, we could do some things. And I think that, as Representative Crouch said, the, the big thing is these groups and organizations that are third party that spend all this money and no one ever knows who they are. They're not disclosed. We have to disclose any contribution over $100 that's given to our campaign. So I think that those groups and organizations at least ought to be, have to file reports with the Secretary of State's office. Okay, uh, thank you. We'll move on to uh, another issue. And we're back to this side of the room. See in, in the back? Um, uh, please step up to the microphone and uh, uh, state your name, and then you can get right into your uh, issue. Kathy Edrington. Um, my issue is the statewide smoking ban. Um, you know, if you've been following local politics here, we keep bringing it up, and we keep changing it around, and we keep talking about changing it. But the common always is that it is in a level playing field from other counties and et cetera. And a statewide comprehensive smoking ban, to me, is, is similar to what we talked about earlier about Sudafed. You know, if you make Sudafed prescription only, it's more of a pain to get it, but it's better for society. Statewide smoking ban, to me, is the same thing, specifically comprehensive. And we've had hours of testimony at city, at city council, county council, county, <coughs> or county commissioner and city council meetings. And it's time to, you know, it would be easier if we just made it the same way across the state. I, and I'd like to know if you would introduce legislation on that and, and or if someone else introduces it, if you would support it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. If, uh, does anyone have a different take on the same topic? Uh, yes. Where exactly do you want to exempt smoking now? That was not a question, sir. Do you have a different take on the same topic? Yes, I do. I, I, I am against that legislation. I think that, for instance, it was, it was taverns recently that I remember was the big subject. And if you don't like that tavern because there's smoking in there, a Budweiser is the same in this tavern as it is in that tavern over there where they don't have it. 
that is that man's corporation, his company, and he should be able to operate it his way. You have the right to go there or not go there. Is that what you're referring to, taverns or some other place? Okay, that's, uh, we're ready for responses from the legislators. Um, any legislator wish to respond? Representative Crouch. You know, let me share with you kind of an interesting um, uh, insight I got on that issue because I, I often thought the way you did that, you know, people do have a right to go to wherever they want. They don't have to go to somewhere. But I received an email from a constituent who uh, delivered beer at taverns and restaurants. And his position was, I don't have a choice. I have to go in those establishments and it is hurting my health. I thought that was a pretty interesting uh, take on the issue that I hadn't considered. Uh, and of course, it's always a rights issue, but when someone's rights infringe on my health or when someone's rights uh, cause a state, or the, as we found out yesterday at the Smoke Free, um, at the Smoke Free Forum that Senator Becker and Senator Toms and I were at, $200 billion is what the cost of secondhand smoke is to the United States. I don't know what it is here in this particular state. But I think there's a, you know, we aren't just looking at us as individuals' rights. We also have to look at the casino workers who work in the casino. And while people will say, go get another job, we all know jobs aren't too easy to get in this day and age. So I, I share that with you because I think that is a part of the issue that we're looking at, not just my choice to go somewhere, but if I'm working and I need a job and I'm working in an establishment that has that, I have no choice over the secondhand smoke. Okay. Thank you. Other legislative responses? See, uh, Representative Bacon. Um, as a respiratory therapist for 43 years, I've seen what happens <clears throat> to people who do smoke and who have secondhand smoke and third-hand smoke and people who don't smoke and live in our area. Uh, and so I, have, I want to preface that because there, I've had many, many patients who haven't smoked a day in their life and never went anywhere that they did and still have lung disease because, the number one, they live in southern Indiana. And it does happen. Uh, so I just want to bring that up. On the business side, I am definitely for the right of that individual to allow smoking in his establishment because, and this is the reason I say this, it's still a legal drug and a legal substance. It's not illegal to smoke, period. When we get that changed, then I will probably change my attitude. My attitude is that it's a terrible thing to have to try and worry about. Uh, and I agree, I've had numerous discussions with Martha uh, over this, some real long discussions. Uh, uh, because I can come from both sides on this as a businessman and as a respiratory therapist and as the next smoker. Um, because, but, but smoking is still a legal right to do. And, and if we start infringing on rights, where do we stop infringing? Now, now we brought, someone brought up the, the uh, ephedrine uh, situation, and, and that's what I'm saying uh, on that as a drug that's causing health hazards and health problems in our community. The, the legislation I want to bring up is to make that a prescription drug, so it would be illegal to get it without a prescription. Smoking is not illegal, and you don't have to have a prescription to get it. So if we're going to allow it one way and then not allow it another way, you know, this, this is just not the right thing to do. It is still a freedom to go smoke for those who do smoke. And I don't say it's right, and I've seen all the sides of it. And, you know, in the 43 years I've been a therapist, but I can't tell that person, nor could I tell any of my patients, for your own health, you should quit smoking. But I can't force that person to do so because that is their right to do so if they choose to do so in our country, in our society. So that's my opinion right now. So I'm very torn on the whole issue. Okay, so. uh, thank you. Uh, next was uh, Senator Thomas. Well, <clears throat> uh, Kathy, uh, and John's got this camera going here. I guess somebody's got to be <clears throat> out here to take some hits on things, and and I ran for office, be honest with you, and that's what I'm going to do. I uh, grew up in a family. My dad smoked. I never smoked. I never did take up the habit. Couldn't afford it now if I wanted to. But um, I guess I lived in secondhand smoke growing up and didn't even know what I was living in, you know. But I got to tell you something. When we start asking for bans on things, 
and for everybody. Be careful what you ask for, because there's a lot of folks out here be happy to write a law to ban it. And sometimes you might lose something you can never get back. Now, I'm not going to tell you that smoking's healthy for you, and I think anybody that's a grown adult and prudent understands that inhaling smoke is not the best thing for you. And everybody's got good arguments about working in places where they have to smell that smoke and they, they don't smoke themselves. But let's keep in mind that you're wanting to take something away from everybody, too, that, that enjoys smoking. And the, the, what we've seen in Evansville, and I know it's going to come up again, where they want to ban uh, businesses from allowing smoking in their, their business. Now, folks, think about this for a minute. That individual's got his life's earnings, his life savings sunk in that business. Now, where does the government get off telling that proprietor what he will do in his own business? Where do they get off? They don't have a dime invested in that man's business. If he chooses to allow smoking, that's between him and his patrons. If they don't like it, they'll go somewhere else and he'll suffer. You know, Illinois, I think, was the state that banned smoking in their casinos. There was a report the other day that they're taking a hit over there. It does have, uh, it does have re repercussions. But besides all of that, keep this in mind that, you know, there's, we, we buy new cars, we buy homes, we buy big screen TVs, we buy things. But for some folks, <clears throat> they don't have a lot of money. And maybe buying a carton of cigarettes and a six pack of beer and a pound of bologna is their trip to Hawaii. We better be careful that we're not taking something away from other people that is dear to them. You understand? I, I hope you do understand what I'm saying on that. You may not agree with me, but I just can't go along with smoking bans. I, I, I don't, I'm not a proponent of smoking, but just be careful what you ask for. That's what I'm saying. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, other responses? Uh, well, we have uh, Senator Becker. I guess it was on. Um, I just think, you know, I think it's, um, I think workers who work in casinos and who work in any job should have the opportunity to have a smoke-free environment because secondhand smoke causes cancer. There is no doubt about it. The evidence, the scientific proof is there. And, and I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, to say to a business, uh, we put all kinds of regulations on business. I mean, they have to have tax numbers. They have to report sales tax. Um, so I guess you could go the opposite way and just require businesses to not do anything. But I don't think that's going to be the case either. So I think, I think if you would level the playing field for everybody, then nobody would be hurt. If you did it for everybody, for all businesses, then there's not one business that would have a competitive edge against another. So if you're going to consider something like this, that is what should be considered. Because once you start exempting businesses out of a, a statewide ban, and I don't think it's going to happen, folks. I, um, the Health Finance Commission had a vote this summer, uh, and it failed by one vote because it was a week before the election, and a lot of folks were not there uh, to vote. And um, when you know you're going to have a vote on something, if you're an advocate for it, you need to make sure your people are there to, to, to cast that vote. Otherwise, you don't want to vote. Um, you want to make sure it's going to pass, and it failed by one vote. That doesn't mean, and it's my understanding, that the smoke-free folks are going to be sending letters and letters to the Senate had asked for the Health Finance Commission to study this issue because a bill did pass the House last year, but it had all kinds of exemptions. It wasn't even acceptable to people who wanted a statewide ban. They didn't want that bill. And that's always what you come up against is if somebody doesn't like your bill, they just amend it so that it's not acceptable. Try to amend it so it's not acceptable to the people that we're proposing the bill in the first place. So it'll, the issue will come up. I do think if you're going to do a statewide ban, it ought to be equal so, and include everybody so that nobody has a competitive edge. Because then it takes away the argument that I can go over here and you can go here. Uh, personally, I, I choose to go to restaurants that don't allow smoking and was very upset when my favorite pizza place a few years ago did not have smoke-free environment. At least I can now go out on the porch and smoke free. <laughs> but I think they got the message. They finally, uh, after a lot of public input, they found that 
a lot of the public didn't want smoking in their restaurant. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we have exhausted our time. So I'd like to thank the legislators for being here and I'd like to thank you as audience for being here. Again, don't forget to sign up with your email and you'll get notifications of these events. Uh, please take your uh, coffee cups, uh, juice cups, and put them on the table. And there's a trash can for the napkins and things. And uh, the donation jars are still out, so you're still welcome to use those any time you'd like. And um, again, keep an eye on the schedule for WNIN for when this might be uh, rebroadcast. Our next event will be in this room in January. And uh, uh, in fact, one easy way to remember this is all of these events each month will be the third Saturday of the month. So you can mark your calendar now for the third Saturday of each month, uh, January, February, March, and April. And uh, that will be the time that we have these events. Again, thank you for being here.